Hello, everybody. It's a couple minutes after 7.30, and I've been chatting with some of the people who came in early, uh, especially with Kim. She signed in at 7, I don't know, 15, 16. She was the first one here. Congratulations, Kim. So it's kind of fun when you sign in early. I'm there to greet you, and we chit-chat, have a good time. Oh, Tamara, you have a cute doggy. What's your dog's name? You're on mute, Tamara. His name's Zane. Zane. Yeah. Cool, like the author. I think I think of Zane. I hear that name. I think of Zane Gray, <laughs> author of all those Western books. Very cute. How old is he or she? He's nine. He's about to turn ten. Oh, getting up there. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. I hope he stays healthy and lives many more years. Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, what we uh, some of the things we talked about before I started the recording for the folks who showed up early uh, was if you're behind, don't worry, that there are no late penalties, that I'm the most flexible online professor you'll ever have. Everything is open all semester, so you can work ahead. Or if you fall behind, you can uh, submit assignments late with no penalties, no late points. And the reason I do that is because we're all busy adults. I mean, Kim, for example, works 32 hours a week and she's taken three classes. That's an example I find personally that community college students are some of the hardest working people I know. So I just wanna allow you that kind of flexibility to me, as long as you can demonstrate that you've learned the material, if you do it ahead of time or on time or a little late, I, I'm okay. I want to offer that flexibility. I knew there must be a reason why your classes were overflowing and the other ones had plenty of room in them. <laughs> it's kind of, Thanks, Trevor. It's kind of controversial. <laughs> There's a lot of people in the math department who are mad at me who who said, there, that's not right. Fred, there should, be, there should be consequences for students submitting late work. That's what it's like in the real world. So you know what I did? I asked my wife. She's a business person. She's an HR uh, 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 talent acquisition coordinator. She works in an HR department, a very, very big, she retired, but she worked for a very big software company. And I asked her, honey, you know what? What happens if you have someone assigned a project or something and they're late? You know, what do you do? It's, that's fine. You know, like people get sick, their car breaks down, their 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 husband, their grandmother dies. I mean, and it happens in the real world. There are things that come up in the real world, that's and you know what we look at are patterns. If someone is continuously late, yeah, then there can be consequences. But uh, so I'm I'm the same way. It's. You know, I want to. I, I know we're in, we're in the real world. Most students are taking classes while they work, have careers, and have families. So I want to offer that flexibility. And I guess Trevor, that could be one reason why uh, my classes fill. You know what else? There are some students who get upset. Really? I, yeah. Oh yeah. For example, I had a student once. I work my ass off to get my work in on time. Why should somebody who's late get full credit? <laughs> so this was this was when we were meeting in person and this class jumped on him and says dude you know not that's not a good attitude man good for you but i'm busy right. <laughs> i'm taking five classes and i work full time <laughs> and i need some flexibility so anyhow thanks trevor so does anybody else have any comments or questions you want to talk about not a math problem but just a comment or a question about the course or about the class or about the book or the website or the uh, college or the professor, any general, any questions of a general nature? Will I be a rounding up and rounding down master after this class? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we were talking before I uh, this with the students who showed up early uh, about what a frustrating problem. I I just it's hard for me to understand. It comes easy to me, but for but many most students in fact I have a hard time with it. 
throughout the entire semester. Even though I cover it in all the Zoom meetings, it's discussed uh, on the uh, in, on the discussion board. There's extra credit about rounding. Uh, keep in mind that when it comes to the homework and the quizzes, I can't. I'm not going to change your scores. If you round off incorrectly, the computer will mark it wrong. Just do it again. Do it over. On the midterm and final, however, you're going to be showing your work. And I'm going to look at carefully at every question on everyone's midterm and final. And if what you've done wrong is a rounding error, I will go into the grade book and award a lot of partial credit. But uh, I'm surprised at how many students lose points on rounding on the midterm and even on the final. You'd think by the end of the semester, you might have been, like, like you said, Rachel, an expert. Not everyone is. I'm still giving partial credit for rounding errors on the final exam. So that'll help. But still, you know, you want every point uh, you can get. So see if you can become that expert on rounding. I'm going to go, I'm going to go over it. Uh, I forget if I did it tonight or if I did it in the last Zoom meeting. I think I did it in the last Zoom meeting. And which, by the way, I still am embarrassed about the technical problems I had uh, for the last Zoom meeting. Tonight's going fine. As I was explaining earlier for the students who showed up before you all, the problem was mine, even though I wanted to blame the gas company for tearing up the streets. Both my modem and router were like seven or eight years old. I called Cox out to the house. Uh, in the meantime, my wife and I had gone out and bought new equipment and he installed it for us. Bang, we were up and running, no problem. He didn't charge us anything. So it turned out to be my fault. The moral is keep your modem and router up to date. Every five or six years, get a new one. But they're expensive, you know? You're going to spend 300 bucks on a modem and a router. But uh, if you do a lot of online uh, work like I do, you'll, you'll, you'll need it. So anyhow, I'm not in California tonight. I'm in Arizona. We have a home in Arizona, in Sedona, where the Red Rocks are. Right. It's, it's, oh, it's so nice here. We bought the home 10 years ago, luckily, because I couldn't afford it now. But here, here's my wife and I yesterday on a little, a little hike. Uh, this is in the parking lot. Beautiful. Interview. Oh, it's so Sedona is just killer red rocks, and everything seems to be going fine so far tonight. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and get out of gallery view, and I'm going to detach my monitor and start writing on my screen with a digital stylus so you guys can see me do some math but you should still be able to hear me and see me i may not be able to see you though so what i'd like is while we're going over the material i won't be able to see you raise a hand or punch the hand raised icon i'd like you to feel free at any time during the meeting to unmute yourself and just shout out a question. And I'm going to actually call on students maybe to help give some answers as well. Okay, so here it goes. I'm detaching my keyboard. Maybe. There it goes. Ready to to the side. Plugging in, you probably can see my ceiling. Okay, but the first thing I want to make sure, can you can you raise your hand? Can you hear me okay? Give me a thumbs. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to share my screen now. In just a second. There. And I am going to optimize it for sound because I'm probably going to play a little video of some kind. So you should be able to see the home screen. Let me just make sure. Uh, okay, some hoorays and thank yous in the chat. Thanks. 
All right, here's our welcome screen. Um, I would still would like you to make sure your webcam is turned on. I do believe everyone is logged in with their full name first and last. That's good. I've kind of asked already how you're doing. I also mentioned that we have some superstars. There are seven students who are caught up with uh, the quiz, the quizzes. By now you should have submitted both quizzes, one and two, with a score of C or better. And we've got seven students who have done that. So there's a, quite a few of you who need to get both of those now done and submitted. And uh, if you haven't done it in the next day or two, you will be hearing from me because even though you can catch up and not lose any points, students have told me that it's really helpful if I get on them. <laughs> You'll be hearing from me. I'll be sending you a, a private email uh, or maybe a group email uh, saying that you need to catch up with the quizzes just as a little reminder. Okay, I do have uh, a couple things I wanna talk about right now. One of them is a video that, that's only two minutes long, we're gonna watch. And it's about how math is not about speed. I know that many of you have been in math classes where other students seem to come up with the right answers so much quicker than you, but I want you to tell yourself that's not what's important, especially in an asynchronous online course where all of you are working at different paces. It's not about speed. It's about understanding of the material. And, and some of you, yes, it may take you longer and more hours to do that, and that's okay. So this video will talk a little bit about just that. The other thing I wanna talk about is the many students who do great on the homework, but bomb the quizzes. I see it all the time. <clears throat> I want to emphasize that the quiz questions are exactly the same as the homework questions, just without the help features. So what I recommend you do is to learn from your mistakes, which is a great way to learn. I do it, I do it all the time. Take a quiz if you're not. Uh, and as you take the quiz, take notes. Write down quiz one, question one. Write down your notes. What did you do? What formulas did you use? Maybe even what page is the formula on? What answer did you get? Circle it, then go on. Next question, same thing. Next question, and so on. The quizzes are only about, I don't know, 12, 15, 16, 18 questions, something like that. And then click Submit. If you're happy with your score, you're ready to move on. If you're not happy with your score, you need to learn from your mistakes and improve your score because the quizzes are weighted more than the homework. So what I recommend you do is uh, go to the grade book. If you need help on this, let me know on the discussion board. Go to the grade book, review your quiz, click on review quiz, click on the little gear icon at the top of the screen and click print. And what you'll get is a printout of the whole quiz with uh, every question, all of your answers and all of the correct answers and then use that as a study guide. You know, it'll be a few pages long. It'll probably be four, five, six pages long. Look at the questions you missed. You'll, you'll see your answer, you'll see the correct answer. See if you can get the correct answer the quiz is looking for and add that to your notes. And then once you've done that, and only then should you retake the quiz. Because uh, let me tell you, I see quizzes I see students retake a quiz right after they took it the first time and their score is no higher. Sometimes it's even lower. That's not learning from your mistakes the way you should be. Okay, so during the breakout groups, I want you to talk about bombing the quizzes. Um, how are you getting high scores on the quizzes? How are you learning from your mistakes? And in the meantime, let's go ahead and watch this video, okay? This is a, gonna be a little bit of technology. Let's see how this works. I'll hit play, and then I'm going to pause it for it and see if you can make sure you can hear it. There's also the captions you can read. 
have no audio on the video. Okay. Can you all, uh, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you, can you hear the, the audio? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear the audio. Thumbs down if you can't. Uh-oh. Okay. You cannot hear the audio. Okay. Let's see what's going on. Um, I can hear you, though. Something else that's really important to know there about math is that being does not mean being fast at math. In fact, the opposite may be true. Mathematicians who we could think of. No, it was working. He just had it working. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. I'll get it going again. Uh, that, 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 stop. Okay, here we go. Of as the world's top math people are some of the slowest math thinkers I've met. I don't say that to disrespect mathematicians. I work with many mathematicians, but they're not usually fast math thinkers. They're deep mathematical thinkers. This is Laurent Schwartz. He won the Fields Medal, which is the top math prize. It's like winning an Oscar in math. He struggled in school because his school valued speed, and he was one of the slowest math thinkers in his class. After he became very successful, he wrote an autobiography, and this is how he describes his school days. I was always deeply uncertain about my own intellectual capacity. I thought I was unintelligent. And it is true that I was, and still am, rather slow. I need time to seize things because I always need to understand them fully. Towards the end of 11th grade, I secretly thought of myself as stupid. I worried about this for a long time. I'm still just as slow. At the end of 11th grade, I took the measure of the situation and came to the conclusion that rapidity doesn't have a precise relation to intelligence. What is important is to deeply understand things and their relations to each other. This is where intelligence lies. The fact of being quick or slow isn't really relevant. Many strong mathematical thinkers, like Lawrence Swartz, think deeply and slowly and like to understand things fully. If you are one of those people, do not be put off by people who may be faster. That isn't important. What is important, to repeat Lauren Schwartz, is to deeply understand things and the way they relate to each other. It's fine, good even, to think slowly about math, and it is really good to think deeply and ask questions that will allow more depth. Questions like, why does this work? How is this method connected to other methods? What would a drawing of the situation look like? And it's important, if you're a slower thinker, never to think it means you cannot be a math person. It is great to think deeply and carefully, to fully understand, to ask questions. We need those thinkers in math. Doing well at math is not about being quick or slow. It's about thinking about connections, thinking deeply. Okay. Okay, thank you for watching that. <clears throat> Can you guys hear my voice? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, thanks. All right, what I'm going to do now is I want you to get into breakout groups. You may be wondering, what am I doing this for? Why don't we just talk about math? Well, I'm doing it for a reason. It's because if students feel a sense of connection, 
with their professor and with their fellow students, they do a lot better in the class. So I'm, when we have time during the Zoom meetings, I am gonna try and spend you know five or six minutes uh, like this, two minute video, four minute breakout groups. In the breakout groups, they'll be randomly assigned five or six students in each group. I want you to talk about two things. Number one, how do you, how fast or slow are you at, at making your way through the material in this class? And if you're slow, does it, are, how are you handling that? Are you scheduling more hours to make up for that? Or how are you handling that? And the second thing is, how are you learning from your mistakes? When you do homework and you make a mistake, what happens? When you submit a quiz and you're making mistakes, what do you do? So if you could talk about that in your breakout groups, that's what we'll do now. So let's see, there's 20 people. Let's do five rooms with four people in each room. And we'll just do this for five minutes. I'm gonna set a timer. So I'm gonna open up all rooms. Go ahead and join your rooms and I'll see you back here in about four minutes, okay? Please join your breakout room and discuss those two things. Hey, Ben, go ahead and join your breakout room. Ben, you should be in room one. Ben, can you hear me? Benjamin? Okay, I'm gonna pause the recording now. Okay, breakout rooms are closing in 10 seconds. So I, I have a question. Yes, Trevor, go ahead. And I actually use a lot of this math that we're doing right now for work, or especially I, I, I really used to. I used to be a finance manager in car dealerships. Oh, but, um, one of those guys. I was. I was one of those guys. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, they still, I, they still, it was a long time ago, and they still talk about me because the power went out in the dealership one night. Ooh. And that usually means they can't sell a car. When the power goes out, because computers are down. I hand wrote one of those long contracts and did all the math. And I told the customer, I'll probably be off by a dollar or 50 cents or something like that. You'll probably have to come back and resign. But it's good enough to send you guys out of here. And I did it. And I was off by like, I don't know, 20 cents or something. on the Damn, phone. that's amazing. They still talk about it to this day. Trevor, can sell a car when the power went out? <laughs> I don't yes. know that I could do it. I don't know that I could do it anymore. <laughs> that is amazing. You 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 did it so often, so many times. You were good at I it. Actually, I actually used to teach. Also, I taught uh, loan underwriting and finance and stuff for a while at a private mm -hmm. trade school in Santa Ana. Oh, really? You're a fellow teacher. <laughs> well, one of the tribe. To... Excellent. <laughs> All right, before uh, we leave the group, uh, before we leave the gallery view where we're all together again, I was wondering if we could do a share out. Is there one person or maybe two who would like to share what they talked about in their group? I'm really curious. You know, how are you handling working too slow, working too fast, feeling stupid, uh, and needing more time than other people? Or a, how did you handle that? And how would you handle... Uh, recovering from and learning from your mistakes. Who's gonna volunteer? What'd you all talk about in your group? Somebody? Somebody go right well, I'll go ahead and say it. I'll go ahead and say it. Yes, thank um, you, Caitlin. Yeah, most of our group, um, there, was a, there was some good insight. One of them, he actually has been utilizing a tutor. So like a private tutor during that, because I have also felt like I do a really good job on the assignments and then the quizzes, I just vomit. So um, he had said that, you know, there are private tutors, there's things like that. And to just slow down and do all of that. So I feel like that was most of what we got out of that for sure. Good. The wise, wise ants app or whatever it is that you yeah. actually told him about. Yeah. So good. he said it's working really well for him. So awesome. I'm going to look have into you, it. Have yeah. you picked, oh, when you do pick one and if they're good, 
share who they are in the discussion board. Okay. Other students may want to work with that that same tutor. I feel like you, a little bit of help, you know, just a, just a little bit. Someone yeah. to at least look at my formulas and see where I'm going wrong would be helpful. <laughs> I will tell you, it can be it can be difficult to find a tutor for this particular class. Most okay. math tutors help with algebra, trig, geometry, calculus, uh, you, you know, the traditional math courses. But liberal arts math is very different. You know, taxes and credit card debt. And a lot of tutors say, I can't help with that. I don't know how to do it's that. To. So it can be hard to find a good tutor for the class. I've noticed, I was saying even also in that same conversation that like Google or, you know, the chat GPTs that we're trying to use in the world right now, those are all wrong. They're all wrong. So I think a tutor is my only way because I was like, well, maybe this will help. No, it doesn't. It's it's wrong. So yeah. Good. Anyway. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> Anybody else? Can I, we have time for one more share out? What did you so talk about? Your group? We're talking about is outside resources and inside resources from the course curriculum when you're just not understanding what's going on, right? And sometimes just a quick Google search for a calculator will get you to the place where it will either explain it in a way that you understand or I understand um, and will get you to that final answer. I shared in the chat the relative change calculator that I use. Now, this specifically... You put in the initial value, the final value, it gives you the relative change and the relative change percentage. And by plugging in different numbers, you can actually see how the process works across the continuum. And it's not just a, hey, give me the answer right away, though it may provide you with the answer. It helps you understand why that's the answer and how you got that in conjunction with the textbook. That's awesome. That's awesome because if you ever do get a tutor and the tutor just says, oh, let me show you how to do that. And they start writing it out. Okay, next. They stay write it out for you. Next. <laughs> That's a bad tutor. Don't let a tutor do that. You should be, if you do have a tutor or if you do use an online resource, you want to hold the pencil. You do the work. And then when you're done, the icing on the cake is to explain back to your tutor how you got the answer. So demonstrating, you know, understanding of the material. That's awesome, Kevin. Hey, you had talked about in, I don't know if it was in one of the messages or the last time we had a Zoom meeting, the Desmos cal uh, calculators, online calculators. So if you just Google Desmos, D-E-S-M-O-S, -E uh, they have scientific calculators, graphing calculators, all this other stuff. So if you utilize the formulas that are in the textbook for the specific uh, problems that you're working in your assignment, the Desmos Scientific Calculator will actually allow you to put the entire formula in there, and then you just plug in the numbers from the data, from the question, and it will lead you to that final answer. So that's another great resource. Yeah. You mean it, it'll, you have to type in the numbers while you look at the formula visually, or does Desmos actually give you the formula and, and with blanks, blanks for you to fill in? Okay, maybe you should share your screen and with us. I don't know if you want to do that or if you're prepared oh, to do that, but I'd be happy to have you share. Hey, hey, yeah, thank you, Kevin. So, all right, so here is the Desmos slash Desmos.com slash scientific, right? So anything that you need to type in. So let's say the shoot. Let me pull up. Sorry, I should have had pull this over here and get one of the formulas. That's cool. All right, so what we're looking at right now is the relative change calculator. So one of our relative change assignments was 6.1 million to 13.9 million. Right? So your relative change is this, and there's your relative change percentage, <laughs> right? So really fast and simple. And if you have those two initial value, final value, which is generally given in the uh, question, it will then show you what the relative change is. And you can also do it 
depending, right? So if you were doing a percentage or per milli, however, however the question asks for the answer, right? Yeah. Um, and then the power of compounding, which was the assignment for last weekend, I'm going to pull up one of the formulas from that. See if I can get to it quick enough to make it worth everyone's while. Um, so we have spectrum internet in El Paso. It's not the greatest. This is very cool, Kevin. So then let's find one. Okay, here we go. The APR. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna go to get more help and you click on the textbook, right? And the textbook is gonna pop up and it's going to give you the formula used to find how you would find an account with a monthly compounding of an APR of 5%. Eventually, this book will open. Come on. Yeah, it's opening up the. Um, okay, so here's your version of the textbook. Address, and then we're going to get to compound interest, right? So, sorry, let's get to the formula. Compound interest formula is right here. All right. So if the starting principal fee is in this case, you have $30,000 uh, or you want $30,000 in seven years from a down payment on a house, right? And the right. account with multiple compounding has an APR of 5%. So there is, dang it, where's the formula for that? Yeah, you're looking at the accessible version of the book. So that is you can you can read this with a screen reader. The other one is the PDF version, looks a little better, but they're both the same book. Fair enough. So all right, forget this question. <laughs> that, that was you picked a complicated one. Of course I did. <laughs> all right, so right here. Your amount is your principal times one plus APR. Uh, elevated to the number of years, right? And so you want to know how much growth there is after X amount of years. So we're just going to say $1,000 at 5% after 10 years, how much money are we going to get? So you go into the Desmos and, sorry, let me pull up. So we can copy this, control C. V, no, that's not going to do it. So we said our principal was $1,000. And it was, I'm going to pull this thing over to the side. If I can continue to see it. Yeah, parentheses. So it was $1,000 times one plus our zero point or 5%. Right, you got a five percent annual percentage rate, and then raised to ten years. After ten years, it's going to be worth sixteen hundred twenty-eight dollars and eighty-nine cents. Right? Yeah. So you can easily put in all the different kinds of uh, formulas. It will allow for two to three layers of fractions of fractions, and you got to. Some of these equations that we have have 17 different parts to the one equation. You're, You're right. Type in all of that into the Desmos scientific calculator and it pops out your answer. And then you just continue on. As long as you know what type of formula you need, you know what to put into this calculator. In yes, awesome. You Thank you. Round of applause to Kevin. <laughs> yep. Appreciate that. And uh, things are different now since COVID. You know, you used to come to a room with me and have a paper and pencil test and you couldn't use 
anything with internet access, you could only use a calculator. And as Kevin said, these formulas are really complicated and entering them into a handheld calculator is a pain. It's very, very difficult. It's much easier to use a uh, online scientific calculator like Desmos. Beautiful, thank you, Kevin. Okay, I'm gonna go back to uh, sharing my screen, my screen now. So uh, now let's start going over some of the questions that are most frequently missed from units 4B, 4C, and 4D. And the ones I've picked are all on the quiz. So um, I, I don't have a chance, I don't have time to go over all the homework, but what I want to do is get the most frequently missed questions that appear on both the homework and the quizzes. And the quizzes are what you want to focus on because all the questions from the midterm come from the quizzes one through four. All the questions on the final come from the quizzes five through eight. So uh, there's a nice review of exponents in your book on page 232. And what's tricky are negative exponents. And those can be a little tricky to enter on a calculator or even an online website. So make sure you can, you can do it. Just pick an example, maybe like the one in the green circle. See if you can use your calculator, either handheld or online, to figure out what 2 to the minus 3 is. Um, on, a, on a handheld calculator like mine, I'll open it up. 2 raised to the power negative 3. There's the answer as a decimal. And if I want the answer... And by the way, I'm going to go to the classic mode because that's where most students, most students have older calculators. So in classic mode, two to the power minus three looks like that. And look at this feature. Take my last entry, but go to the math menu, tell it to give me the answer as a fraction. And there's your one eighth. So it'd be nice if you can, I don't know about that fraction feature. That's something that you probably won't need for this class, but make sure you know how to enter negative exponents for this class, because we do that a lot. Okay, in unit 4, 4B, there are some big formulas. They both assume that you plunk your money into uh, a bucket, an account, and it you it never changes. You never add anything to it. No more deposits are made. Like the example Kevin just gave, that $1,000 uh, stayed alone. No more deposits were made. So you have compound interest, where N is the number of times per year it gets compounded. And the other formula... What happened to the, uh, oh, the other one is compound interest with continuous compounding. Whenever you see that word continuous, it involves a special number, the number E. You probably learned about it in your last math class, but you may have forgotten. Um, for a cool little 10 minute video, I posted a link on the discussion board, I think yesterday, to a video on the number file website where this cool little guy, friendly little guy, talks about the, the history of the number E, what it is, where it came from. And I, I recommend that. It's, it's kind of abstract and it's difficult because most students think, well, E is a letter. It's not a number. Well, yeah, it is a number. It's a number between two and three. And it showed up in the accounting uh, process hundreds of years ago with with uh, with uh, with uh, compound interest. So let's try one, shall we? This this is this one does not use the number e. This is your traditional formula. There is no number e in it. It's uh, a little more complicated than the formula Kevin gave to us. 
because it what Kevin did was compounded annually. So there was no fraction in it. But now this is compounded uh, monthly in this particular example I picked. So n is going to be equal to 12. OK, so let me detach my screen and hopefully Okay, so I I need to ask, can you guys, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear my audio? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. I never know every time I detach the, my screen. <laughs> All right, so let's start plugging in. I'm going to set it up for you and then ask you guys to turn on your calculators and, and give it a try yourselves. So our starting principle for this case is, uh, for this problem is $9,000. The APR is 3.65%. Aha, uh -huh. I can see why one reason right now why this one is missed by many students. To change 3.65 into a decimal. It's not 0.365, it's 0 0.0365. I'll bet you that's the first troublesome spot. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and, and let you guys enter this into your calculator or into your online website. And if someone can tell me the answer, and I want you to make sure you follow the directions round to the nearest cent. So you're going to get, as an answer, you're going to get a, a, a nice long decimal, you got to round it off according to the directions, okay? When you get an answer, go ahead and shout it out, please. Oh, Kevin just offered in the chat uh, his cell phone uh, that he can hop on a Zoom call for anybody for further uh, help. That's awesome, Kevin, you the man. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, when someone gets an answer, go ahead and unmute your mic and shout it out. I got one. And uh, you all should try this on your own. This will give you a chance to practice before you take the quiz, before you take the midterm. You, because I often hear from students that using their calculator is one of the hardest parts of this class. Okay, I just happened to open the chat. Kevin, you got it. Thank you. So let's take a look. Uh, maybe I can share my calculator. We got nine thousand plus point oh three six five divided by twelve raised to the power twelve times sixteen. I want you to to notice how the exponent is in parentheses. If you don't put those if you don't put the exponent in parentheses, uh the You'll get the wrong answer. I'll show you. Let me get the wrong answer on purpose. There. You may think that you'll get the right answer, but the computer, the, the calculator is going to follow the order of operations. It's going to raise what's in parentheses there to the 12th power. <laughs> and then it's going to take that answer and multiply it by 16. And the answer is going to be wrong. The correct answer would be making sure you have the exponent in parentheses. Now we'll get the right answer. And let me uh, 
do a screen copy and paste this into the notes. I like to include in the notes everything that I do, both on paper and pencil and on the calculator. Look at that, isn't that cool technology? So notice with no parentheses, I got the wrong answer. No parentheses around the exponent. Oops. Gives you the wrong answer. So there's the correct answer. And now we need to round off. Here we go to the nearest cent. So let's do a lesson in rounding. What digit is in the cents place? It's the seven, right? So if you round off to the nearest cent, look behind, and if it's four or more, which in this case it is, you cut it off or round down. Some people say you don't really lower it. You just cut it, truncate it, cut it right off. If it's five or more, then you would round up to 48 cents. Okay, let's move on to the next one, unless there's any questions. Before I go on, are there any questions? Okay. Um, we... We, we took quite a bit of time earlier in the meeting than I planned for. We are going to go over. So I am uh, I often go over 10 or 15 minutes, but this is going to be more. We may end up going 20 minutes or more over time. So I want to warn you in advance. Um, and I will understand if at 8.30 promptly you have to check out. You can always watch the recording. But, uh, but I and urge you to stay on with me if you can until we're done. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. The first thing you wanna notice is the word continuous. As soon as you see that word, you know we need that special formula. You see it down there at the bottom of the screen with the number E. You do not use the compound interest formula that we just did in the previous problem because this is continuous compounding, you need to use the formula with the number E in it. So uh, I show you the formula. <clears throat> uh, it's a four part question. So let's do the first part. I set it all up for you. Go ahead and enter that into your calculator. If you wanna fool around with the number E, I have, uh, you should all have a E to the X button. E is that number between two and three. So if you do E to the first power, you can check to make sure um, that you can raise E to whatever power you want. Notice the parentheses, the, the exponent is in parentheses. Uh, it's a good habit to get into. So go ahead and give that a try. Uh, somebody besides Kevin, can you shout out the answer to the first one? After one year, what do you get? Make sure you round to the nearest cent. And you should have more than $17,000. Anybody? Is it 17,782 for the first or seven? one year? Somebody besides Kevin, tell me what you get. Just shout out. Yeah, Kevin reminded us that E is available. And okay, somebody besides Kevin, who's got it? Yeah, if you could shout it out, I can't always look at the chat, but I, I am now. Uh, yes, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Kim. You both got it. Uh, 
Let's see. Um, you know what else you can use besides Desmos? There's two other online options. The Windows calculator. If you can see on the screen, I've opened up the Windows calculator and I'm choosing the scientific calculator. There it is. So we could do the problem this way. Let's see if I can do it. 17. Nope, it's only 7,000. Hang on. 17,000 times E raised to the power 0. 0.045. I wonder if this is going to work. <laughs> no. Okay. Every calculator is a little different, isn't it? Okay, let's do 17,000 times E raised to the power 0. 0.045 equals. Hey, I got it. Woohoo! So there's the answer using your Windows scientific calculator. I'll copy this and paste it into the notes. And then I'd like to show you uh, another website besides Desmos. It's called Mathway. Let's see if I have it open. Nope, I'm going to have to open it. Trevor also commented in the chat. Uh, mathsolver.microsoft.com mathway.com algebra it's another cool site I recommend let's see if I can get the answer that way 17,000 times e raised to the power 0.045. Answer, please. Yeah, there it is. I'll copy and paste this into the notes and then we can move on. Math Solver also does it. Even though there's no E button that I see, I just typed it in. With Mathway, you can go back to the formula you just did and tap on it, and it'll put it back in the too line. Many, too many windows open. <laughs> When I use these, I feel like I'm cheating. Okay, so we got the answer there and there using the Windows Scientific Calculator and Mathway and then Desmo, uh, Desmos. Kevin gave us a great demonstration on that. Um, I'm going to skip the next two parts because they're the same, just a different number of years. Just make sure you put the exponent in parentheses. But I'm going to go down now to the last question, the last part down here, and that's to calculate the APY. And that confuses some students too. APY is the relative change from the original to the accumulated total after one year. So the original was 17,000. 
I'm sorry. After one year, the amount was 17,782 and 47 cents. The original amount was 17,000. So that's the absolute change. And to get the relative change, we divide by the original amount. That's just the formula for relative change. The new amount minus the original divided by the original. That's equal to the APY in this case. And if you use your calculator for that, you end up getting, let's see, I'm going to do it all in one command. 17,782 and 47 cents minus the 17 in parentheses divided by the 17,000. All right, there's our answer as a decimal. But the APY, do they want the answer as a decimal? Let's look at the wording to the question. It says the APY for the account is approximately blank percent. Do you guys see that percent sign there? It means they want the answer not as a decimal, but as a percent. But they want the percent rounded off to two places. <laughs> so tricky, huh? So who can tell me that number you see at the bottom of my screen is the decimal. I want that change to a percent to the to round it off to two places. That's going to be the hard part. What is that decimal rounded changed as a percent, expressed as a percent, rounded to two places? Anybody? Anybody be new? Besides uh, Kevin or Ben or who else was it? Kim? Somebody new. Somebody who has not given me an answer, who has not given us an answer before. Anybody? <laughs> Trevor says using all this technology feels like cheating, huh? <laughs> it's the real world, man. It's not, there's enough, this, this class is hard enough as it is. <laughs> All right, I'd like to notice that Caitlin's answer, thank you, Caitlin, was 4.6. Now, it's said to two places. So let's take a look at what Caitlin did. She took the decimal point and moved it two places to the right. So it goes right there between the four and the six. So it's 4.6027, yada, 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 percent. Four, 4.6027, et cetera, percent. And now they say round it off to two places, which would be right there, 4.60. If you include the zero, that shows that your answer is accurate to two places. However, you probably know that 4.60 is the same as 4.6. So the question is, will the computer give you full credit for both answers? I don't remember you guys to tell you the truth. <laughs> I I I know it'll give you credit for the 4.60. But if you just put 4.6, it might mark it wrong. It won't. Uh, it won't. Let I had me know a similar if anybody question. Can... Lucy, did you have a comment? Yeah, I had a similar question and marked it wrong. I didn't go up. Shoot, I can't hear so you. So it marked it wrong. Can you guys hear Lucy? Oh, got it. I'm sorry, Lucy, I can't hear you. 
In oh, it marked it wrong. Yikes. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. But shoot, I don't I'm I'm mad now because you guys can't hear me. I mean, because I can't hear you. Is that true now, you guys? Can if you unmute can your hear microphone, you. for example. Uh, let me just try somebody. Can you hear me? I can Kim hear you. Hoang, can you unmute your microphone and talk for a second? Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, I can. Uh... No. <laughs> I can hear you. Can you I hear can me? I can hear you, Kim. I can hear okay. all of you. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> well, I guess we'll have to continue using the chat. But you can hear me, though, right, Kim? Yes. Okay. We can hear you. I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah, you can hear me, but you can't. I don't understand what's going on. I apologize. We'll have to make it work. All right. We'll. I will continue to, to check the chat box. I can see when someone has posted a new chat. And you can all hear each other, too. I'm the only one that can't hear you. <laughs> Doggone it. <sighs> yeah, it must, it must. I'll bet you if I plug, if I put plug my, if I plug my monitor, my screen back in. Let's see. All right, Kim, try talking now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> uh, so I have this little Jabra Bluetooth speaker and microphone. And when I plug that in, it, that's what I've been using. And for some reason, when I detach my screen, the audio goes out. But I have to detach my screen to write, so we'll we'll deal with it. Okay, let's go on. Let's start unit 4C. Okay, I just detached my screen. Can you guys hear me? Caitlin, Ashley, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear my voice? Okay, good. Thank you. Now the formulas get even more complicated. <laughs> um, unit 4C introduces two new formulas. These are where you deposit an amount uh, in terms of making regular payments. So that is the difference between unit 4B and 4C. In unit 4B, you put an amount into a, an account and leave it alone. In now it, the formulas in unit 4C involve regular payments where you either start from an empty account with a balance of zero and make regular payments to pay up and save an amount for something versus paying down. And they call it an installment loan. But paying down is where you, you receive an amount of money up front you get a mortgage, for example, and you have to pay it off. You're paying down a mortgage. So if you use the wrong formula, you're screwed. <laughs> I, I can't put it any more bluntly. They're both complicated formulas. They're both similar. They both involve regular payments. But you must understand the difference between starting with a balance of zero and paying up to save an amount versus receiving your loan up front and making regular monthly payments to pay off that loan. If you use the wrong formula, you won't get any partial credit, but me and the computer will both mark it wrong and you're screwed. <laughs> so pay careful, careful attention to which of those two formulas, the pay up or the pay down. Um, ooh, I, for, I, I'd like, I have a nice little uh, PowerPoint slide 
with all the personal finance formulas on one page. Um, payment, uh, if you can see formula number one, that's the formula that Kevin used when he took us, uh, when he shared his screen. Formula two and three were the uh, formulas that uh, from unit 4B. Formula four is the other unit from 4B, but it's continuous compounding. So formulas one, two, three, and four are where you put an amount of money in and leave it, a no leave it alone. No additional payments are made. Now, starting with units 4C, we come to uh, formulas five, six, and seven. And make sure you know the difference. Are you paying something up or are you paying it down? Okay. Uh, formula three is the same as formula two. It's just solved for P. Formula six is the same as formula five. It's just solved for the payment. And then formula eight is kind of something different. I'm not even sure that that is covered on the quizzes. I don't, or the midterm, I'm not sure. But I will post this little uh, summary of all the formulas in the discussion board later tonight. I call them the elite eight. <laughs> right? Because for the NCAA basketball tournaments, you have the Sweet 16, you have the Final Four, in between is the Elite Eight. All right, so let's try an example. Let's see what we got here. Gotta get to the top of the page. Oh, I need to plug in the power. That's what's happening. Okay. My uh the, the glitches were the power. When I detach my screen, it sucks up the the for the power from the second battery. But I got juice now. Here we go. What is happening? I'm not sure why. <laughs> Sorry about this. This is going crazy. Another technical glitch. I don't understand why it's cutting off the right hand side of the screen and why I can't show it to you. All right. I was going to show you this formula and see if you can get the correct answer for this example. I'm not able to justify to left justify my okay I'm going to close Microsoft notes and open it back up again sorry for this come on No, oh, no. There it goes. There we go. That worked. Okay, we are going to try this example. It's the it's an it's a, an example of the most complicated formula. Um, that you'll have, although it does, although it doesn't have negative exponents. Formula with negative exponents are even harder. And that comes up at the very end of the night. That comes up at the end of the meeting. So I kind of wanted to have you guys try this tonight while we're in the meeting, but we're going way over. And I feel like we should skip on. We should move on. I don't know.
What is the N in this formula again? Um, do you, can I ask uh, Caitlin, Kim, Kevin, could, do you think we should, if you can give me a thumbs up, if you think we should plug these numbers from the example into the formula or if we love, can move on? I would love if we could. Thumbs but... up that we should plug them in. And <laughs> All right. In for sure. It'll take in. a minute. But, uh, and I apologize for how late this is going. No, this is helpful. I can hear you. Right. I can hear you too. Um, it does show you how to do it step by step in your book. That's what it is. On page 252. But I'll show you how to do it. The N is the number using, of months, or the number of times uh, that your calculator all in one step. So the N is the number of times that it looks like this. The numerator is going to be 100. Yes, Kevin, I don't, I don't think, think you can hear you again. Have nested yeah. parentheses. But yeah. The number of months within the year. Yes. Inside That's the right. innermost we can all hear each other. Yeah, so we can all hear each other. Plus point oh six over twelve. Move your calculator. And that's going to be raised. That's going to be raised to the power 12 times 35. And that has to be in parentheses. And then we subtract one, which, by the way, is the step that causes the most students to miss this question, is forgetting the minus one. That's the numerator. 100 times that whole big thing. In the denominator, we just have 0 0.06 divided by 12. But that has to go in parentheses. Now, if I hit enter, I should get the correct answer uh, of 142,000 something. It'll be nice. Yay, I got it right. Let me copy and paste that into the notes, and then we can look at it some more. Okay, I want to make clear all about these nested parentheses, because many of you are going to be using like a TI-83 or a TI-84, kind of like what I have, what I showed you in the video. What we have in the numerator is... The outermost parentheses is 100 times that whole big quantity in parentheses. Inside the parentheses, you have this raised to the power this, and both of those have to be in parentheses. So the numerator is 100 times that amount in the blue parentheses. The denominator is this amount in the blue parentheses. Very complicated. Now, if you use Desmos, for example, or Mathway, which do you want to use, Desmos or Mathway? Let's use Desmos. Desmos Scientific Calculator. It's loading. There we go. Here we go. It's going to be 100. I'll, I'll, I'll make it so it looks just like in the book. 100 times a fraction. How do you do a fraction? Okay, let's try this. One plus 0 0.06 over 12. Ah, so you do, you do the division sign. Then use the right arrow to get the cursor outside of the parentheses. Uh, 
Then we have an exponent. There we go. 12 times 35 in parentheses. <laughs> this is complicated, huh? And then from that, we have to subtract one. But there's a fraction underneath all of that. Ooh. Nope. How do I put a fraction under all of that? Nope. <laughs> You highlight the entire formula that well, you've done. what I can do is do this yeah. calculation and then so divide. All of you guys who are watching right now, put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. <laughs> divide the answer. You'll see it. <laughs> no, you didn't no, but you're very helpful. You're very helpful. All right. So you highlight the entire formula by 0 0.06 over 12. Then hit. The divide. That should be our correct answer. And it is wow. not. <laughs> that is not. Yeah. And then you got to divide it by 0 0.06. Let me try it again. Point so I will share it. Spam the chat. I'm looking. Oh, there's the fraction icon. I see it. It's a little A over B. Yeah. That's what I was looking for earlier. I need the day. Okay, I'm going to start again. 100 times a fraction. Good. And in the numerator goes the one plus point point oh six over twelve. Raised to the power twelve times thirty five. From that, we subtract one. And then down in the denominator, it's 0 0.06 over 12. Yay, I got it. <laughs> Give me a thumbs up. Give me a round of applause. <laughs> There's the answer. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Caitlin. I can see you and, and, and everyone else who gave me a thumbs up. Thank you. That took a, took a minute. <laughs> So I'm not going to show my mistakes above, <laughs> but there it is in Desmos. All right, for all of and you, you guys. can use Mathway, your scientific calculator, um, you know, any any which, whichever way you choose. But we're not done yet. I haven't, we haven't uh, given the answer. Let's see the directions. The directions say How much will you have? Well, it doesn't say. So let's just assume that you're going to round it off to the nearest cent. So this rounded off to the nearest cent would be three cents. So this also says compare it to your total accumulated deposits, which would be $100 times 12 months times oh. 35 years, right? 3,500 times 12 is... 350 plus 70, $420,000, right? You guys are so probably you saying all kinds of cool been, things to each other. And I can't, you know, I can't hear you. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, let's move on. $42,000 and you ended up with $142,000. Kevin's waving hi. <laughs> oh, there's 10 messages in the chat. Let me check. <clears throat> My bad. You can't hear me when he's talking. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right. I really appreciate you guys talking to each other. That's the way to, that's awesome. Okay, seven pages down, eight to go total. All right, now we have a question from unit 4C that's unusual. <clears throat> Your goal is to create a fund and they tell you that at the end, you wanna have a $81,000 saved up. But they're not telling you what the principal amount or the or what your monthly payment should be to get there. So if you'll if you'll notice at the top of the screen, the regular pay up formula, you you take the payment and the APR, et cetera, and plug it into the formula to get the total amount. But this time they're giving you the total amount, $81,000, and you have to come up with the payment. So there's a little twist to it. In your book, they give you the formula to solve for the payment, but it's also number five in your elite eight formulas. So you can simply plug into that, which I'll do for you. Uh, you wanna end up with 81,000. The APR is 5%. You can't see the problem with this calculator. That's the numerator. In the denominator, we're going to have to use some nested parentheses. 1 plus 0 0.05 over 12. That has to be raised to the power 12 times 16. Then we subtract 1 from it. And then I can close the parentheses finally. Now, when I hit enter, I should get our, our payment, which should be about $276. Cross your fingers. Okay, let's, let's, I'm gonna choose two and I'm gonna have my calculator bring me to where my error is. Yeah, my parentheses. Ah, I forgot the parentheses in front of the 12. Right there, let me insert. The number of left-facing parentheses has to equal the number of right-facing parentheses, but the calculator uh, allowed me to go ahead and insert that, and now I can get, and there's our correct answer. There's our payment. And then I think we have one more problem and then we'll be then we'll be done. Again, round off to the nearest cent. You look at the cents place and the digit behind it is four or less, so we cut it off right there at 22 cents. And there's our answer. Okay, let's go to the last page, and I'm sorry, we're already more than half an hour over time. Super apologetic. I really apologize for this. We're, we'll be done in about uh, five minutes or less. Okay, in this question from unit 4D, I wanted to include it because there's two parts, a part A and a part B. And I did post a message in the discussion board that you can skip part B because it involves logarithms and we don't learn logarithms until the second half of the class. So you can feel free to skip part B. It does mean that you won't get 100% on this question. Uh, but getting partial credit on one question, on one homework assignment, uh, trust me, will not affect your grade, I promise. So this uses the pay up formula, which is, we haven't used this one yet tonight. It's a pretty complicated one, but let's plug 
um, into it, give it a try on the calculator, and then our, we can end our meeting. All right, the payment is going to be equal to the principal, which is $120,000. times the 0.07 over 12. That's the numerator divided by, now we have the whole denominator is going to be in one big parentheses, the, the outer parentheses. There's the left parentheses for the denominator. And it's one minus parentheses. 1 plus 0 0.07 over 12 raised to the power. Ah, this one has negative exponents. To do that, if you can see the bottom of my calculator, look at the very bottom line. Look at the small parentheses in uh, the small minus sign inside parentheses. That's your leading negative sign. If you hit the big parentheses right there, you will get an error message on your calculator. So the 12, make it negative. Negative 12 times 15. So the exponent is negative. You'll use that little minus sign in parentheses. And then finally, we have to enclose the whole denominator. That's the right-hand outermost parentheses for the denominator. And now when I hit enter, I should get my $1,078. Cross your fingers. Yay, I did it. Let me paste that into the notes. And then we can uh, go back into gallery mode so I can hear you talk and we can end the meeting. Again, we're gonna round off to the nearest cent. So it's $1,078.59. How do I know it's that? Because nine is in the cents place, two places past the decimal. Look to the right. If it's five or more, you would round up to 60 cents. Since it's a three, we truncate it, cut it off right there. And there's the answer. Okay, uh, the next meeting is in two weeks, but that's Halloween. Let's talk about that. Um, I, I'm okay with it, but let me stop sharing my screen and we can we go back in gallery mode? And then we can talk for a minute. Can you hear us now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yay, that is so weird. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> um, in regards to your question with next Tuesday or the next meeting being on Halloween. Yes, Kevin. Readers here end at eight o'clock at night and we don't start this until 8.30 at night, my time. So I'm good with it being the same time as everybody, or as it's always been. But yeah, for the I, rest of you Californians who are going to be starting at 7.30, it is what it is. So if you make it an 8 o'clock start time in California, I'll be here. Just let me know what it is. The problem is an 8 eight o'clock start time in California, it, it would still be trick-or-treaters coming to your door. And the parties would still be raging. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trick-or-treating and partying. <laughs> So I was just going to say, trick-or-treating is essential, right, for a three-year-old? So yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we've got two choices. We can keep the meeting the same time. And for those of you with kids or you're going to a party, you can just watch the recording, post a brief summary of the meeting, and you'll get full credit. Or you can just okay. have it on Wednesday. Or we could change the day. Or that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a better idea. <laughs> I feel like that's Sounds better. Change the day. I'm, I'm free on Wednesday nights. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. Mm -hmm. 
That's a while. All right. Um, Hello? On the other hand, I'm wondering if I should open uh, up to a vote for uh, the I'm rest of the call. class. Hi, Caitlin's kid. <laughs> How is Grayson? Thank you. <laughs> Getting ready for, for Halloween. Bedtime. Huh? Bedtime, uh, hopefully. In a moment. Well, here's what oh. I can do. I think what I'll do <laughs> is maybe oh. Oh, send out an email, a mass email, no, and say I'm during sorry. the meeting, we discussed what? having the next meeting the, the following day, which I guess that'd be November 1st, right? Mm -hmm. And then I can have students reply to the mass email, the mass up. class email with their opinion, yes or no. Then I'll just go by the majority. How's that sound? Yeah, but I'll, I think I'll also mention that in the Zoom meeting, we talked about having it the next day. And I suspect that's what we'll end up doing, which is fine with me. Keep in touch. I'll let you know. Okay. Thank How you. was that tonight? Did it go okay? I'm so sorry. We went way over. I normally don't do that. I normally go 15 minutes over maybe. This is the... Honestly, it was helpful. Good. I think it was extremely helpful. There's so much to cover. Only meeting like this once every two weeks. There is so much to cover. And then we've got the barrier of the technology. So I appreciate your uh, your flexibility. But I, I, I don't think we'll be going over this much anymore. That's my plan. <laughs> All right. Any other comments? Any other comments? No. Okay. Well, good night, everybody. I'll see you in a couple oh, wait, weeks. Night. And I'll, I'll also see you online. Bye. You know, I check that discussion board every day. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you for everything. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Congratulations on your granddaughter. <laughs> thank you. And Kevin, man, thank you for sharing your screen. That was awesome. I enjoyed that. Look, what is that? A baseball cap collection back there? It is. So <laughs> being a uh, follically Cute. challenged male. At least they're organized from Are a women's kidding? perspective. They're organized. I know that's, that's pretty damn impressive. Like, yeah. like, you know, I left the space here for the door to open up and not knock the hats off the wall. Oh my God, that is planning. Right. That is genius. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, if you want to get really into it, so. These are all Kansas State University hats down here where my wife went to college. <laughs> and she gets one row. In UTEP. Uh, and these are all baseball hats, which will now get moved up because it is now football season and hockey season. So those will come down to the easy to reach hats, right? <laughs> That's so, too cool. Yeah, all right. So, real quick, uh, Press Belden. When yeah. you are showing the problems and then pulling up your calculator, because the calculator is covering it, so there's no way for us to try and do the problem along with you because we cannot see it. So, yeah, I'm aware of that. I don't usually do that, but tonight I was rushing. Yeah, no, I totally understand. We took a lot of time on other subjects, and I understand why we wouldn't have had an opportunity for for that to be like on a separate screen or a split screen, right? And so I was just letting you know that it was one of the issues that we were running into tonight, um, just for future I was worried about that. I was saying, yeah. okay, now I'll get the answer on my calculator. I opened up my calculator. I thought, ah, shit, I'm covering up the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we couldn't see it at all, but yeah. it, it is what it is, right? Um, and then with your, uh, screen separated from whatever so that you can do your screen writing, right? That is keeping you from being able to hear us. Maybe an opportunity for you would be to connect uh, Bluetooth headphones that have a microphone. Yeah, I think it's this problem. Yes. This thing is connected to my keyboard. Right. So, so when I detach this monitor, boop, <laughs> Right, it's, but somehow you—it's still here. You're still hearing my mic. I bet I know what it is. It's, it's disabling this, and you're using my, your computer, my purpose, phone. my laptop microphone. So if you were to connect maybe Bluetooth headphones to your laptop, you would still be able to hear us and speak through the Bluetooth headphone microphone, 
And then regardless of what the setup was, your computer would default to those headphones. Yeah. Right. I so might, maybe an opportunity for you. I might try that. I'll work on it with my wife. If not, I've got your cell phone. It's in the chat. <laughs> maybe I'll have Absolutely. a fake Zoom meeting with you. <laughs> sure, why not? And you know, however you want to do it to to make it work. And I understand like you've been doing this for a long time, but we are all using newer versions of the latest and greatest technology, right? Um, I don't know everything. No, I don't know everything. I don't presume to know everything either. But yeah, this is a new something new. This, yeah, this absolutely. thing has been a this jobber thing has happened. This this has given me a similar problem before. But so yeah, I'll work on that. If I have a trouble, I'll be reaching out to you. <laughs> well, no, for sure. And if Appreciate you it. do want to try out one of these other options to see if it works, feel free to start a, a Zoom meeting with me and we could troubleshoot it and figure out what works and what doesn't yeah. before the next class session. Yeah. Right? I do have a nice set of over-ear headphones, Bluetooth yeah. headphones. Yeah. No cord. So, that might work. So I use... Most of the time when I have the door open and trying to keep quiet for my wife, I have a pair of Bluetooth headphones yeah. that I hook up to my computer uh, hey, you, so that we can have, do that. Do you have five minutes right now? You want to try, try it right now? Sure. Do you want to continue recording? Yeah, right back. You want to remove the recording? Oh, yeah. You're right. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Let me stop the recording. Hey, class. Have a great day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. More, more. Stop recording. Bye, everybody. <laughs>